it's almost impossible to find the torque specs on this because these are pretty small machine screws and I just go and uh, snug them by hand. This one here I think was 20 feet pounds. That one may have been 20 feet pounds. I'm going to double check before I start tightening. Need to slide this plate back in there. Whether I go through here, trying to get my hands under, it's going to be hard because I actually have the track on, the cog on, so it'll be fun. Just going to try and get it behind there with my fingers and then put a few screws. Okay, so that backing plate, what I did was just put one screw in right now to hold it. And I'll actually put the uh, carrier on, hold it with my fingers, pull the screw out. After looking at this 4,000 times, I think the shaft will work. The question is, is it going to be right? You have kind of like a divot in there, right? So that bearing is going to sit right against there. And I did think about this. The bearing will push in further than I think because you have this little edge right here. Right, so you got the lip, and then if you look at the inside of the bearing, it's it kind of smooth, so that would actually push up against it. You can see on the old bearing, like it's not even completely covering the shaft the way it was sitting. Uh, I guess it would be, yeah, this side here. Let's see how it's nice and clean in there. That's the point where it's sitting. See, it's all like about a millimeter. I know it's only a millimeter, but who knows? Um, yeah, where it's nice and clean, that's gonna sit right in this concave here. So you're not getting full coverage on it. This is what I'm dealing with here. This is uh, quite the job. You gotta pull a ton of stuff off to do it. I know I've tried to make like a how-to and have all the steps and film as I go, but it is kind of tricky definitely found some ways around doing things where other people I know they've pulled full fairings pulled the gas tank like this back rivet is it's hard to see but it's really tricky to get to because you have this pillar here so your rivet gun's not actually going to go on there straight and it won't actually put the rivet on correct so what I had to do I guess yeah here's a piece of the old rivet so your rivet on a second say that's your rivet you know it's sticking on there right and you're gonna want to put your rivet gun on there if you have this on an angle it's not actually gonna compress in there correctly and it'll be completely loose so that's what happened with the first one i had to actually drill it out what i ended up doing was putting a nut on here it sounds really ghetto i used a dime like money on the other end bent the stem in my vise so the stem's crooked but now you have literally i had a little nut or a washer or whatever you could use have that to keep the stem straight and then dime on the back side so when you're compressing your rivet gun it's keeping pressure straight on the rivet it's hard to explain but it'll actually pull it straight up even though your gun's on an angle and that's the only way i could get it to do to put this riveting properly so yeah, there's, there's going to be lots of little things you can overcome and it's not easy. It does take time. I want to do this right. And now I'm really gambling with the whole, do I need a shaft or do I not? And honestly, when I talk to Polaris, they do not want to give you any information. They want you to bring it to the dealer, which yeah, if it was under warranty, that'd be great. But I don't really want to spend $1,500 or whatever it's going to be doing this. Um, yeah, I'm getting sidetracked here, but yeah, if I can save 500 bucks and not use the shaft, I will. Okay. With the bearing pushed in, it's going to be <clears throat> right on that center line. I marked it so it's easier to see. With the shaft.
shaft pushed in all the way, running a razor blade down from the housing, that's where it's gonna land. So that bearing is gonna have to be just like that, basically right where it was, which is pushed against the edge. So I think it'll work. I measured with micrometer, measured 10 times over just to see cleaned up quite a bit it was starting to become crazy in here funny i'm running half snap-on tools half craftsman stanley whatever i'm gonna try and run this bearing on the existing shaft try and save 600 bucks i think it's gonna work honestly the only thing i can see being an issue is how it's riding on the shaft i don't think that's a cause of these bearings going you can see it's from the outer race here this split from a chisel, but it was like when I was trying to hammer the bearing off, it split, but it looked like there's like a fracture line there previously. And that looks very similar to a lot of other guys. That's where it was riding in the housing. So I think the housing is the big issue. The shaft getting a new one would be a benefit, but again, it's $600. So I'm gonna try and run this one. I'll try and at least press the bearing on with the new deflector, slide it in. If it doesn't fit, well, I got a new bearing deflector and a clean shaft that'll i'm assuming work if i check the compatibility it should work on the older sled so i could always sell that or do something with it keep it whatever right so that's where i'm at The bearing on should be exactly where I need it. The new collar on. Just gonna put some chain case oil, a little bit on the shaft. Just ripples in on the other side. Just goes nice into that seal. That looks like that bearing has to go on more. Give it a couple, couple extra shots on there. Let's see if this goes. Hey, okay. that's awesome. That's snug. And that's gonna work. That bearing's pressed right in. It's going nowhere. So, the existing shaft does work. I didn't show this on camera. I'm trying to keep this kind of short. If you want to grease your drive, your drive shaft bearing, it's right behind here. What you have to do is loosen off the track. You have a tensioner nut on one side and the other. You're going to want to back these out, get your track really loose. Because what's going to happen is when you pull these screws, that's going to take all the tension off your drive shaft under there. 
So what I had to do was kind of support it with one hand under there. Um, one screw, two screws, three screws, those are actually connected to the snowmobile. And then these three are connected to a backing plate that kind of supports the bearing. The bearing's the exact same one as this. I pulled the seal. It's really not that bad. It was a little bit dry, but not even close to this. So I did kind of clean out a little bit of the grease with a piece of paper towel or a shop towel and then put some synthetic waterproof grease in there. Not crazy, just a little bit more. It feels a lot smoother, it's nicer. Uh, just something you guys can do when you have this all apart. Torque specs on these, it's 18 feet pounds. I couldn't find any torque specs on these. This one is like generally the same area and that's 26 feet pounds. Um, I kind of compared and split the difference and I think I just did like 20 feet pounds but really like, yeah, there, there's nothing on this. I think they just want you to just crank it on. And when you're doing these screws, you really wanna make sure that you're into that back plate. Cause when I actually went to go and look at the back there at my drive shaft, I noticed one of the screws had gone through, but just pushed the back plate. It wasn't actually seated in there. So I had to back them all out, make sure they're seated in that plate. Okay, you're gonna wanna put your gear chain back on. The washer, beveled part in I think the torque on that is 29 feet pounds. I will verify that. My track is completely loose, so can't really torque that yet. Last time what I did was I actually had the track on the ground uh, because I have no brake rotor. So I could always snug it right now. Yeah, <laughs> have to put my, adjust my tension, drop the sled and snug that up or you just do it like some of the dealers and get the milwaukee drill and just do a couple arugas put a little bit of chain case fluid on there you don't have to i will snug that up at the bottom Just aligned the track and adjusted the tension. What you do is back off these lock locking nuts. Uh, these are your adjusters. There's one on this side and one on the other side. So if the track is starting to go towards the camera right now, what you're gonna wanna do is actually thread that in and then that will actually put tension on that wheel and start bringing the track over that way. Uh, with the gear case taken apart, it's kind of easy. I can spin the track. I don't have to start the sled or anything. Um, from there, you're going to want to measure on this sled. It's 16 inches from here, and it's going to land you right about there. That's where you're going to want to measure from your slider to your track. In this case, this thing's studded. I believe it was 7 eighths of an inch is what you're going to want. Uh, you're going to have to keep rotating the track if you are aligning it, and you're going to want to put 10 pounds of weight right about there. That's how you adjust your track. So that's adjusted. Then you're gonna wanna, actually, sorry, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is actually loosen up your axle. It's a 15 mil uh, nut and sock. Okay, so I have the sled lowered on the ground, so it shouldn't go anywhere. Funny enough, if I actually run my torque wrench on that, it might move the sled, it'll actually drive it. So I might have to put a bit of tension on the running board. Uh, I started tightening this already. It's a 17 mil socket, and I have a swivel head on the end of this. It's uh, torque to 29 feet pounds. Okay, so the drive gear, that's torqued, 29 feet pounds. I tied in my chain tensioner. Just crank that in with my finger right there, as hard as it would go. 
and then backed it off about a quarter turn, which will get you, this is what Players is looking for, is about a millimeter of play on the backside. So now we just have to torque this nut, really, I don't think anybody's doing that. I think they call for 22 feet pounds on that. So I'm gonna do that now. You're gonna wanna make sure you have this jack shaft spacer on. And next you're gonna want to put the cover on. Make sure your seal is all clean, nothing in there. That's gonna stop the seal. This is hard to show. I don't have my tripod. My wife has it. I'm gonna have to start a GoFundMe to get another one. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but um, it's kind of tricky to get this in. You have to make sure on the plastic belly pin underneath here that those two screws are removed. And that gives you some play. If this is oily, it helps, but really, it is tight. You have to uh, actually put the bearing on there and kind of just force it over. That seems to be the only way I can see to do that. So yeah, it's kind of fun. Maybe I can set the camera up here. I had the camera actually propped up on this O2 sensor. It was recording, which kind of sucks. You can't really see. But anyway, right there, you would think that you could just put this one end in and kind of tilt it on, but it won't because of that bearing. Uh, so what you do have to do, like I was trying to explain, was put the bearing over the shaft with your cover tilted here and basically just ram it forward and you can see like the scrape marks there and it'll just kind of pop in. Sorry I couldn't film that one. Once your cover's on, you're going to want to torque these 10 mil chain case cover bolts to 11 feet pounds of torque. There is a torque sequence. So you're going to want to go one two, sorry, one, two, three, four, five. So again, that's one, two, three. And the fourth one's back there, and then the fifth one. And torque that to 11 feet pounds. If you're like me, and you don't have a torque wrench that goes below 20 feet pounds, all mine are half inch drive, I basically convert everything to inch pounds so it's 132 inch pounds just convert it all so you just multiply by 12 so 11 times 12 132. I had a bit of a standstill on this side uh, when I was going to torque these chain case cover bolts one actually snapped it felt like it just kept kind of getting tighter wasn't sure if it was pulling the case in so even at 11 feet pounds I even lowered it down to like probably eight feet pounds just to see if I could torque it at a lower setting. Yeah, snapped it. I had to drill it, it was actually that one there. I had to drill it out for probably like an hour, drill it out and then use an extractor. I have pictures, I didn't video it, it was kind of annoying. Uh, so now I need to just get a bolt. So just be careful on that because that could be quite the nightmare if you don't get it out. I got lucky on that. So I'm gonna leave that side until I get a bolt. And coming around here, I'm gonna try and put the uh, oil tank back on. So this deflector, I don't know if you can see, it's hard to do this with one hand. Um, it actually hooks in there. Yeah, so it goes like that. And then normally, it sits up here, these two studs, with the nuts on top. What I'm gonna do is, it's actually just resting on the clutch there. So I have a little air bubble here. I'm gonna have to try and like, just feed the uh, oil to it. Kind of hook it up and let it spew out until I gotta get rid of that. And then hopefully the air will shake up through the jug. Um, this is the only way I found I could actually put the reservoir on. If you look here, like that's your clearance. If this was actually up on that platform, it's way too high. There's no way you can tilt it. At least that I can see. So I'm gonna try this and see what happens. So that oil line's on. What I was doing was holding it here and I actually squeezed the jug a bit. And that little, I don't know, I would say it's like half an inch 
bit where the nipple is in that was dry but i actually filled it with oil by just squeezing this and then pushed it on now there's just that little clamp i got to put on and then bolt it into place here all right have the oil tank back in Don't forget to plug that in to your level sensor yeah it just hooks in here kind of pry everything make sure this plastic part of the tank is behind the metal tab if it's on the other side it won't work the bolt has to go through push in against the tab but yeah it's not too bad just put an extension using a quarter inch drive with an extension that's the torx bit for here and this is 210 mil bolts not sorry all right, back in the garage again. So after snapping this mounting bolt, I found a temporary replacement. That's a bolt and a washer. Right there, as you can see, I drilled it out, got really, really lucky and uh, used an extractor. So basically it just reverse threads, like almost a screw that reverses in and unthreaded it. <clears throat> So you do not want to over torque that. That was snapped with a torque wrench. I don't know if I can grab this temporary replacement because Polaris has sold out of these and they want $20 to ship one just for shipping. Uh, so this doesn't have the washer built in. Uh, this one looks stretched out. If you actually look at another one, the thread length is about the same. So what you want to make sure is if you are finding an aftermarket replacement, you want to make sure this distance here that's not threaded is the exact same as the other one or if there's actually more threads in here because you don't want to torque this and then have it bottom out into the threads there you want it to bottom out into your washer so yeah there's my pile of uh, stuff there i just ran one of these washers here on there so yeah food for thought you want to make sure this O-ring is in good shape. Install it right in the groove there. And you're going to want to put your bushing over. Okay, before I put this caliper on, I just wanna show you, this is how the pads go in. They literally slide from the top and then this locking pin goes in. Um, make sure you do not press your brake lever in or pull it in when there's no pads because that's gonna compress your caliper which is what I did. I should have put a zip tie because it's a really bad habit when I'm in the garage. If I'm talking to somebody, I start flicking levers. So wife came in, started talking to me, pulled the lever. Yeah, had to uh, just compress this back. Hopefully that's enough where the pads will actually clear the rotor. Put one of these on for now.
caliper is aligned. I pulled out this bolt. Might be kind of hard to see. That's just a 3 8 drive ratcheting extension bar with like a swivel head. And that's basically the only way I can get it there. Try and get this. So you get your hand on the back just to kind of guide it. And then just slowly ratchet it in. Okay, these you're gonna to want to torque to 40 feet pounds if you can get your torque wrench in there. This you're gonna also want to torque to 40. Grab your brake. Next, put your cover on, torque these to 22 feet pounds. For the speed sensor, it's a 10 mil bolt back here, seven feet pounds of torque. Run the cable through here, zip tie through there and around for your uh, pressure vent here for the chain case. Make sure you connect that back on. Put the washers as they were. Torque this to 18 feet pounds, hold your brake. Really not a lot. Okay, back at the bench, don't mind the mess. Way too many things on the go. Um, there's your Polaris chain case oil. They want 310 milliliters max for the fluid. So basically you're gonna pump it in until it starts to show up the threads, but no more than 310. So I'm gonna mark it on the jug and pump it out. T40 torques again. The torque setting is four feet pounds on this. This is what I used to actually drain the fluid the first time, pump it out. Then I just made this. So what I had to do was put this tube on the end, cut it on a 45 to try and get it down because you have to jam it in and get it underneath that lower gear. I really didn't like doing this method. So that's basically to the threads. Whatever's left in this, I'm gonna pump out. Just torque that up, clean this with some brake cleaner.
sled's all wrapped up, back together, put the belt on. I did not show how to set the belt deflection. What you do is this adjuster nut here, you back it out, and then you use this uh, Allen key bolt. If you thread it in clockwise, that's gonna actually open up the sheaves, and that'll bring the belt lower. If you turn it counterclockwise, that's actually gonna make these two sheaves close, and then the belt will ride higher. You're gonna have to keep doing that, spin this until you get, I think it's an inch and a quarter deflection. So you would run your ruler right across there, mark your point there, push down, and that's it. You can kinda see, uh, find out how it's sitting on the sheave by eye. You can probably find some specs online. Uh, yeah, the exhaust, that probably took me longer than anything because there is a very hard to reach exhaust ring underneath the pipe where it connects there. So that one sucks to get to. I just ordered a moose racing spring removal tool. Uh, what I actually had to use or tried to use was this. It's a flathead with the tip ground down. After putting everything back together, I did run the sled just on the stand here. I know that's not a way to really 100% test it and tell if it's tried or true, but that will come within the season. Let's pop some free play, that's great. Um, yeah, it did run good, feel smooth if I actually move the secondary clutch while it's on the stand. It's free, it's not binding, and that's it. I will try and make a few other videos. I wish I could put everything in here, but I didn't want to make it too long. Like I cleaned my primary clutch, I cleaned the secondary, took those apart, uh, scuffed the sheaves. That's something you can do really quick. If you get a Scotch-Brite pad, a green Scotch-Brite pad, you can go in a circular motion and clean your sheaves, get all the belt residue off and kind of rough it up a bit, give you a uh, better performance. And yeah, that's it. So hope uh, you guys enjoy and maybe this was useful. Maybe it was a waste of your time. Hopefully not. Uh, I know I'm talking a lot and ranting and trying to explain what I'm going through while I'm doing this. And it's not just like a five minute how to where I just fast forward through everything and uh, kind of make you guess. I was trying to explain the whole theory on whether you need a new shaft or don't need a new shaft because I went back and forth with that a million times. So in this case, it looks like it's going to work. Hopefully it works for you. You can prevent your sled from exploding. And uh, yeah, that's it.